Okay. Just work steady. But I can still say work. Yeah. We ready? Yep, we're on. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Malala City Council and Planning Commission Joint Work Session and Meeting. Um, we're going to convene this special meeting and start with roll call. So, where do you want to start? Go ahead. Oh, Steve Major from the Dyer Partnership. Ryan Quigley, the Dyer Partnership. Gerald Fisher, Public Works Director. We have a Childress Counselor. Uh, Jennifer Satter, <laughs> Planning Commission. Doug Eagle Bear, Planning Commissioner. Glenn Boreth, City Council. Raylan Bosford, Planning Commissioner. Elizabeth Klein, uh, City Council. Dan Huff, uh, City Manager. All right, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're going to start off with a, it's, uh, I guess I should have said the time earlier, 6.15 on May 30th, 2018, and we are going to start off with a presentation of Wastewater Master Plan by Dyer Partnerships. Okay. So I'll hand it over to you. Yes, that's me. Um, before this meeting, we've had three meetings with the TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee. We've had three meetings with the Project Advisory Committee. Those included six hours for each, and we're going to try to condense it down to 30 minutes, 25, 30 minutes for tonight. Um, don't have to worry about public comment, but as we go through, I'll be covering a lot of information. Ask questions as we go. Um, the plan is not on the city's website yet, but a hard copy, you're going to get a two volume. Volume one, technical information. Volume two is all the backup documentation that we have in the plan. So, fairly extensive study. And with that, the items that went into creating the study, we had to look at uh, the background and planning information, uh, see how the system collection and treatment were operating, basis of planning, what were the regulatory agencies requiring us to meet. Study area characteristics, <clears throat> the main one here is population projections. Then we have to look at uh, future design conditions, considerations. We evaluated your existing collection and treatment. Uh, we performed an infiltration and inflow study. Infiltration is water coming in the pipe, high groundwater during the winter. Inflow is rainwater getting into your system. We had to evaluate the improvement alternatives, and we looked at a ton of alternatives, came up with the recommendation of capital improvement plan, and then, of course, you have funding and implementation. <laughs> so the last facilities plan that the city completed was in 2000. Ironically, the improvements were in two phases, and if you take the dollar amount from that plan, bring it to 2018 dollars, or 18 yeah, dollars, it's five million more than what we're recommending for improvements. So <clears throat> actually, back then, the city was looking at a huge improvement project. You're still looking at a, a huge improve, improvement project today. The city did a biosolids management plan in 2013. They did a consolidated recycled water use plan in 2015. That plan recommended Class A recycled water. Uh, we were authorized in 2017 to do the master plan, which will be done shortly. We're also authorized to do an amendment to your 2015 recycle water use plan uh, because the city is constantly getting in violations based on the 2015 plan of class, class A. The city's permit does not require Class A, B, or C. You have to meet one of them. It doesn't require Class A. So we're recommending Class C. We're also recommending that the city be allowed to spray before the groundwater is three feet below the surface. So what's happening is the grass is dying before the city can spray. So we're recommending that after 12 inches, they can start spraying. Go ahead. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, that plan has been reviewed by DEQ. It also was uh, reviewed by the Oregon Health Authority. And there's going to be a public hearing held here uh, July 10th at 5.30 in this room to talk about it. And I think the main issue is because we're at 6. 6 oh, at 6. 6 p.m. 
the main issue is we're recommending a lower class than what's been recommended before. Now, the irrigation group is not here, but what we told them at the last meeting is even though we're asking for class C approval, the treatment system is going to be capable of doing class B. The disinfection system is going to be capable of doing class B. The disinfection for class A and B is the same. The only difference between class B and class A is suspended solids and you have a turbidity requirement. We want to eliminate that because the city in the past has had problems getting the turbidity requirement. So even though we're asking C, what we're trying to do is eliminate the city getting violations when there's an upset at the plant. So we can always make C, it's designed to make B, and disinfection B. So we're st and with B, we get 50 more acres and we can irrigate. So we think it's doable. And again, the city will stop getting fined for not meeting A. Okay, the existing plant was constructed where it's at, 1980. For some reason, I do not know why, when they built the lagoons, they also included a DAF unit, dissolved air flotation, and filters. Back in 1980, Clean Water Act, all they're trying to do is get secondary treatment. The filters, technically you get tertiary treatment. Then the effluent pump station and force main, uh, constructed in 2000. That's the force main that sends the effluent to the Coleman Ranch for recycled water. That's also the pump station the city uses. And here in 2006, to eliminate discharge to Bear Creek. And then 2002, they added a new headworks transfer pump station. Again, a new dissolved air flotation unit and gravity, gravity uh, sand filters. Talk about population projections. <coughs> Part of the driver for the, for the future flows and the size of plant we're looking at is due to population. Here in 2017, 9,939 people. We got to go 25 years because you got 20 years for once the plant's constructed, has to last for 20 years. But we got five years to get to the point where it gets constructed. So in 2043, you're almost doubling the size of the city at 16,977 people. We do not come up with these population projections. We are required by DEQ to use the Portland State University population projections. We have to use them. So they're saying this town is going to double. I'm not sure where all the people are going to go. Where are going to put them, but population-wise, you're going to double. So your existing wastewater treatment plant, you have the screens here. You have one mechanical screen. You have your aerated lagoon transfer pump station. you got two big lagoons that equal 25 uh, acres. Then you got the DAP units here, gravity filters here, chlorine contact chamber, and then your effluent pump station. Your recycle uh, water use sites, the main one, Coleman Ranch, 433 acres. Uh, cemetery site, which isn't used as often as it used to be, at 3.4 acres, and then you got 8.1 around the plant. Wastewater flows, again, we're projecting for the year 2043. The two flows that we're concerned about is your peak instantaneous flow. Everything coming into the plant has to be sized to handle peak instantaneous flow up until the point where you either have an EQ basin or you store the difference between peak instantaneous and peak day. An EQ basin is equalization. Equalization basin. So peak day really is what we're designing the treatment units for, is for that peak day. So your NPDES permit is the, and I knew I'd forget, so I wrote it down. <laughs> it is the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, NPDES. Every plant has one. And in the city's case, you've had repeated violations for suspended solids concentrations, which leads to higher mass loads that you're discharging to the river. Yeah, here we are with the turbidity. I mentioned it earlier. Earlier, the Class A turbidity. You've had violations there, and then when you get violations there, you have disinfection violations. Don't call for them. Is a measure of your disinfection uh, system. And then the other thing the city can't do is discharge from the months May through October. 
but because you do not have the holding capacity and times you have excess flows coming to the plant, you have to discharge in May and June. Otherwise, you're going to overflow the, the, the lagoons. So when you look at the collection system, how do we gauge if it's in good shape or not? We look at the EPA criteria. With infiltration, again, you have high groundwater. They say your per capita flow can be 120 gallons per capita. The city is at 229. And then when you have rainfall events, they allow that flow to go up to 275 gallons per capita. You have 633. So you have excessive inflow and infiltration. Is that thing? No. Watch in system, we smoke tested. The reason we smoke test is where we, we put a machine over a manhole, we blow smoke in the system where it comes out of the ground where it's not supposed to. That means you're getting inflow, you're getting rainfall coming in. And we found 208 deficiencies, which were. Our breakdown of the deficiencies, um, we found uh, 19 leaking service laterals. So those are laterals from the house uh, sewer system to the, the mainline sewer. So um, any smoke coming up out of yards or sidewalks, we know there's a broken sewer lateral in those locations. Um, leaking main lines, we found two locations where smoke was coming up out of the ground um, over a uh, sewer main. The catch basins, so on the storm drain system side of things, any spot where smoke was coming up out of the storm drain, we know that there's either either a cross connection there, so water is getting into the catch basin and into the into the sewer main at that point, or there are fractured pipes in the area, so smoke is penetrating through um, and, and getting into that system. Uh, we had 44 leaking manholes, um, which the city has been out and addressed quite a few of those, most of those at this point. Um, so that's, we hit, set the smoke smoker up. Um, we're seeing smoke coming up out of the side of those, out of the street. So we know that there's infiltration getting into those. Um, open cleanouts, 107 open cleanouts. So those were mostly residential spots, um, anywhere where your sewer, sewer lateral comes out of your house. There's a clean out there. A lot of them were missing or broken. Uh, so we caught a lot of, a lot of those. Um, and then roof drains. So anywhere smoke was coming up out of the gutters of your house, um, we saw nine of those, um, which indication that that somehow was tied into the sewer system. So any rainwater getting into the gutters was is, is finding its way into the uh, sewer mains also. So, so this this is what you don't want to see. This is what is that <laughs> on Tolliver Road just uh, before you hit Creamery Creek Lane there. Um, so that is <coughs> so the city. Once we identify these deficiencies, the city has aggressively made an effort, like with cleanups, put the cap on. Instead of having an area drink, put the cap on. And with their efforts to date, when we looked at comp comparable rainfall events, they've cut the flow down by 6%. I mean, that's a start, that helps. The other item, <coughs> excuse me, the other item was the flow mapping. Flow mapping is where we actually go out with weirs Sticking in manholes uh, from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. to measure mainly infiltration and inflow. And so we identified a number of sewer lines that have high incremental increases in flow between manholes, and it equals 8,750 lineal feet that we're recommending repairing during phase one. So the phase one improvements consists of uh, seven projects, $4.4 million. That estimate is based on complete <coughs> pipe replacement. Once we TV the lines, there are other methods like inversion lining, maybe a spot repair. That will reduce the cost, but we didn't want to come in with the low number and say, oh, by the way, now the project's a lot higher. We want to start out with a conservative, conservative number. Phase two has four projects for $2.5 million. Phase three has 10 projects for 6.2. I don't know if the city would ever get to phase three or need to get to phase three, but what you eliminate through these projects, you gotta realize <clears throat> the water's gonna mitigate to other areas. So it's a never ending battle of chasing this water. But the more water you reduce, the less you have to deal with treatment in the future. So your building capacity by, by doing these projects, eliminating the water to get to the plant. 
And then we also recommend, and DEQ recommends, that you videotape your entire collection system. We're saying over a five-year period. The city really can't videotape all the system because they have a lot of large pipes that have too much flow in them, so you can't really run a camera down the pipe. So once you start doing these and eliminating flows in the larger pipes, then you can go in and TV those. But it's just, like I say, it's a constant battle. EQ expects the city to allocate X amount of dollars per year in your budget to deal with II. We've already video inspected probably 50 percent of the city, most of the older lines upstream. Quite a bit of it. Then you have pump station deficiencies, and the worst one is the South Malala pump station. I think that was that's the oldest one. It's, it's hydraulically overloaded. The wet well leaks. Uh, the controls are so out of date. So we're recommending improving this pump station during phase one. The Taurus pump station. Again, it's hy hydraulically overloaded. It's noisy. But again, the city's efforts with, with reducing II has cut the run times on those pumps by 50%. So we are seeing benefits from the, the low hanging fruit. They also have, uh, you see phase one, South Malala, we're estimated 672,000. Taurus pump station phase two, 369,000. The other pump stations are also phase two, and each pump station would run about 206,000 per pump station. Let's talk about the efficiencies at the wastewater treatment plant, the headworks. Uh, you do not have any grit removal. Grit ends up coming in the plant, settles out in your aerated lagoon. Uh, the influence screen is undersized for future flows, but when they built this headworks, they made a channel right here. So you can add another screen. Easy upgrade. <laughs> Area Lagoon, common theme with all the, all the processes at the plant, hydraulically overloaded and bi biologically undersized. The city spends a lot of money removing algae and suspended solids from the treatment process, especially to get the class A. Everything goes back in that lagoon, be sent back through the system. There is no waste stream to eliminate it from the system. And that's that's why this becomes biologically over overloaded. And the city had a survey of sludge in the lagoons, in some cases, eight feet deep. If you have sludge eight feet deep, you're not getting treatment in those lagoons. Again, transfer pump station, undersized, captive sludge lagoons, undersized, excessive solids accumulation. You don't have enough stars, that's why you're discharging during dry, dry weather months. Uh, we'll talk more about those. Dissolved air flotation, undersized, overloaded with algae. When they get overloaded with algae, they pass it on to the gravity filters. If the gravity filters can't take them out, then you have violations. I just mentioned no, no waste sludge, so everything you're removing in these components you're just shipping it back through. And then disinfection, uh, safety concerns. The city uses pellets that come in, in uh, uh, five gallon buckets. When they transfer that, the pellets to the disinfection unit, there's, there's chlorine powder that's hazardous. Uh, it's expensive with the pellets. You have insufficient contact time. You see the chlorine contact chamber is green, that's carryover of the algae that couldn't be taken out. Fortunately, you have a five mile pipeline to deal with the insufficient contact time. So technically you get the contact time in, the, in that five mile pipe. No redundancy, any short circuit, but again, short circuiting with the five mile pipeline doesn't matter. Effluent disposal, when I first looked at the city's plans, I thought great to have lagoons, it's cheap to operate, cheap to maintain, until I got to the F1 pump station. You, those are 300 horsepower pumps. Huge energy consumption. Everything, whether you recycle or discharge in the Malala River, goes through that pump station. So those are, they're running 24 hours a day. The operational bottleneck is at your decor um, facility on the Malala River. There's a uh, pipe that goes through the deep cooler facility that we're going to have to go around because capacity wise won't allow us to put the new flows through. 
Typically, you can't irrigate May and October. We're actually doing two things. We're trying to get, get it where the city can irrigate sooner in May with the groundwater not being three feet deep. And we're also going to ask for a, a permit modification that if the conditions are right in, in the river, that city discharge. Insufficient liquid storage, uh, failure of Class A discharge requirements. That's again why we want to go Class C. File solid management. Here you can see the sludge buildup. When it's that high, you're not getting treatment, you're not getting available storage. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Dredging, the city has done some dredging. They just got an estimate that dredged um, Lagoon 1 out and also the air raid the Lagoon. It has two feet of sludge in it. The estimate was 2. point, two point a little over 2.5 million over five years. So it's not cheap. So overall assessment, really your, your current plant cannot perform to meet the being compliance with the MPDS permit. Uh, upgrades are necessary so you can meet your permit and also for the future growth with the doubling the size of the population. Uh, the, the recycle water use plan needs amendment to class C. We're also recommending permit modifications to increase the mass loads and allow discharge during May if, if the conditions uh, allow it to. All right, treatment plan alternatives. The first one, wetlands. I know some of the people on the council are familiar with Prime Mill. Um, I found this document the other day on the internet it is a document prepared by DEQ and the Oregon Association of Clean Water Agencies. It lists all these communities that have wetlands treatment that does water recycle. Um, it lists Albany, Bend, Cottage Grove, Junction City, Medford, Myrtle Creek. For some reason, Malala is not on this list. I don't know why, but it's not. But not yet. Roseburg. So how do all these communities, how can they do, say, lagoons, treatment, and wetlands? I was telling Gerald this earlier before the meeting. Tuesday night, I turned off all the lights in the living room after I read this report, trying to figure out what's the connection, what's the difference between Malala and these communities. Simple. Let me go back. Malala is the only one that uses their lagoons for treatment and storage. They're the only ones that only have 25 acres. Primeville, they have 354 acres. They, they made wetlands and lagoons, 120. Roseburg, they have conventional activated sludge. They, They do this, they treat everything first with this. <clears throat> they get it to secondary depth one. Then they go to a 300 acre ranch and eventually seeps back into the river. Uh, City of Myrtle Creek, they use an oxidation ditch to treat. And then they have a separate large lime lagoon where they store the recycle water before they, they put it on the golf course. City of Sutherland, we're doing a choice water treatment plan upgrade for them right now. They bought uh, for excess uh, recycled water because the golf course can't handle it all. They bought a 220 acre parcel that has a 95 acre lagoon. Again, Malala has 25 acres doing both treatment and storage. And that's why uh, when you look at the land area requirements, you look at a lot of these communities, they're providing secondary treatment before they do the recycled water. You don't have the area here, and you're not providing secondary treatment. So, to me, Malala is unique because you're again you're doing treatment and storage in a single vessel. No one else on this list does that. They have huge land areas. Uh, Albany with their talking waters, they I don't know how many millions of dollars they just spent upgrading their plant, and then when they discharge to the wetlands, it's eighty some acres. 
again, a lot larger land area than what we have to deal with. So, questions? Well, I would be curious how many of those communities went out and bought additional lands to be able to expand their operations. And how many actually owned them in the beforehand? My guess is some of them bought the lands and did the expansions. I don't know that answer. Okay. But I'm sure, well, in fact, I know for a fact for, for Roseburg because they discharge you around to South Unqua. Uh, and so they face the TMDLs with that river, which would be astronomical increase in cost to upgrade their plant. So they bought that 300 acre ranch. They bought it. They bought it. Cost them $9 million to buy it and develop it. Yeah, I have a question. Okay, I, I do have a question. So just because our land is limited is why you're saying we can't do this. Did you do any testing around here to see if the land would accommodate that system? Well, that's the other problem. When you look at Primeville, you look at you look at the climate, you look at the groundwater table. It's a dry climate. The groundwater table is not at the surface like it is here. So really it's it's strictly it'd be a summertime thing. Wintertime, you're gonna discharge the river. But then is if you build more lagoons, and this is another problem where the city gets some violations with mass loads. They can't irrigate in October, they're storing up all those wastewater in lagoons and trying to get rid of it in the wintertime to make room for the wet the additional flows that come in that increases that increases the flow of the river increases the mass loads so in wet climates you're not really worried about discharging the winter time it's the summertime and i don't know where you find 80 acres so you didn't do any testing we didn't do any testing. okay are you no. talking about soil type uh -huh. but we already know um that our groundwater is high. It's high in the city. It's high at the um, ranch because we monitor the ground levels before we irrigate, um, which is one of the reasons why it had to be down three feet. We're mm -hmm. changing it to one feet uh, so we can start applying sooner. And then we mm -hmm. monitor the uh, groundwater level and the moisture content of the soil. We don't go over um, what the soil can take. Um, but in all those cases, we have high groundwater throughout the entire area. So I think if you look at, go back to Prime, 120 acres. I don't know where there'd be 120 acres around here. Around the country. There's some land <laughs> around here. <laughs> and then you still have to, you're still gonna have to pump it five miles or thereabouts to get it. Okay. And you have to, you have to find willing property owners who uh, are willing to sell the property. You want to try to find properties that are all um, adjoining each other so that you don't have property over here and property over there because you've got to get infrastructure to multiple locations. Um, you have to maintain it long term. We talked about <laughs> replacing sewer lines. Eventually, those other lines, they will um, reach the end of their useful life and then we're having to replace them. So when you look at doing something like that you want to try to find um, areas that are generally in one location that all of the property owners are willing to sell their property um, at a reasonable rate i think if you look at communities in the willamette valley okay i didn't mention the oregon gardens uh they provide secondary treatment first all we need to provide secondary treatment just about every community provides secondary treatment first before they go to a wetlands. Mm -hmm. So and with your system to make secondary effluent be tough. Because it's overloaded, you don't have you, you don't have a waste stream. You're dealing with algae is one of the toughest uh, materials to deal with, get out of wastewater. Um, so. so we did look at lagoon lagoon enhancement. They do make treatment systems that you throw in the lagoon. <clears throat> Actually, you grow algae, they harvest the algae. Um, the problem is you, you use the lagoons for strictly treatment. 
you lose the storage. You can't do both. Uh, the original facilities plan in 2000, they recommended taking sections of Lagoon 1, making it into aerated, an aerated lagoon, making it into a fat potato sludge lagoon, buy the property next door for effluent storage. But you can't, anything with lagoon enhancement is not going to work because, again, you got the, you got the storage issue. You need more storage. <laughs> Uh, high reduction only, that's not going to get you there. No action isn't an, isn't an option because you're in violation of your discharge permit. So you have a sequencing batch reactor, that's all that is, is you're processing the wastewater in one, one basin. Conventional activated sludge, you're processing the wastewater in an aerated basin and then a clarifier. So you have additional units. Aquadation ditch is similar. The conventional activated sludge where you, you treat one basin, settle in another. Membrane bioreactors, they produce drinking water quality effluent. Problem is, the size of your plant has cost prohibitive. So you're, again, we're sizing it for 8 million gallons a, a day in the summertime. You're down to a million gallons. You got 7 million gallons of membranes sitting there doing nothing. That gets, it gets expensive. So, when you look at the, we looked at the four, what we felt, the four most viable options, the SPR coming in, when you look at capital cost for, plus present value for O&M, the SPR comes in at 8.9 million, the conventional activated sludge comes in at 10.9 million, the oxidation ditch 14.1, and the membranes 17.3. So the least cost alternative, SPR. I used to say cheapest, but one of the tech meetings. <laughs> <That's laughs> yeah, yeah. So the least cost alternative is the SPR. So the other wastewater treat plant improvements, you need to add in the second fine screen, you're looking at adding grit removal system, turning the aerated lagoon into a uh, Equalization basin, transfer pump station needs to be upgraded, construct the SBR. Uh, when we do modification to your lagoons, I'm sure DEQ is going to say you got a lot. Uh, UV in the, in the wintertime, so you don't have to worry about dechlorinization. And then summertime, with the reuse, recycle water, you want sodium hypochlorite, you still want a chlorine residual in that F1. Effluent pump station improvements to be adding a third pump. The discharge monitoring station, we're going to bypass around that. Uh, we're, we're going to eliminate or create a waste stream that you can treat and get out of your system. So that requires aerobic digesters and a dewatering press to reduce the volume. And then we got to remove the sludge, and like I say, line it before we can use it for storage. All right, this shows preliminary layout of where the improvements are. So you have your your headworks here, you add a screen, make this the EQ basin, upsize the transfer pump station, put your new process units over here along the highway, add your aerobic digesters, and then you have uh, biosolids dewatering and new control building. That looks great on paper. This right now is classified as a wetland. So you're going to have to... Uh, with any improvement in the size of the improvement, you have to do an environmental report. Um, somehow the wetlands have to be mitigated. When you do the environment, environmental report and you get to the public comment period, NIMS is going to get involved. And when NIMS gets involved, then we're also going to be looking at stormwater treatment. So. And who are the NIMS? National, oh, sorry, National Marine Fisheries. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so you look at improvement costs for the for the construction cost, 27 million. Engineering is 5.4. No matter what you do, you got to go through value analysis and value engineering. <clears throat> value analysis, you get outside experts that don't have any irons in the fire. They come in and review this plan. They may tell us we're all wet. It's stupid. You don't want to do that. You want to do something else. Anything's on the table. Everything's on the table. They come in review and they they assess that plan. They tell you things that they think they can improve. 
they try to look at ways of saving costs. Doesn't mean that there's going to be a lot of changes, but it's open, and they can say these guys are full. And who does that? You hire, you advertise for value analysis team. Um, typically, the team consists of a couple other engineers, process people, uh, could be a contractor, planner. They put a you know team together. They sit. We present the plan to them. They spend three to four days over looking the plan. I've been involved with a number of them, what they do. Once they're alone, they start asking members, throw out ideas. And you can throw out 400, 500 ideas. And then you go through and decide which ones are really worth evaluating. And they may bring, bring it down to 100. And out of that 100, they may come up with maybe 50 recommendations. But again, they may say, SBR, that's stupid. You don't want to do that. You want to construct a conventional activated sludge. And so then they come up with a report. We go through with the council in the city and address each item and say if it's worthy or not, and, and then come up with a final decision. That's fine to make sure we're heading down the right path. But once we get to pre-design, you do the value engineering. Value engineering goes in, they know what you're going to construct, they look at how you construct it better. So they come up with ideas to achieve the same end result, but maybe there's better use of an existing facility that one of your existing facilities we haven't looked at. You know, they come up, again, they do the same thing. They put the stickies on the wall. You look at the ideas. Um, they, they do a report. The only problem, it's not a problem, but the only thing you have to realize, they're looking at a plan in three or four days. We're spending two years evaluating things. So they may come up with, with a recommendation that looks like you're going to save a lot of money, but you start getting into it. It doesn't have to. Um, City of Sutherland, they did both value analysis and value engineering. And nothing really came out of value analysis except there there was concerns about providing class A. Uh, there are certain individuals that thought they didn't need class A. Class A was needed because of the golf course. When they first constructed the golf course, golf course there was no homes. Now it's surrounded by homes. The other is not all the effluent can go to the golf course. So they send it to Forest Pond. Well, to utilize the effluent and make it a recreational facility, you need class A. Class A, you can fish, you can boat, do other things. So they're gonna they're gonna um, develop Ports Pond into hopefully a stop where people of I five come up and you know use the pond. Value engineering, excuse me, value engineering report showed that they're gonna save one point nine million dollars. They didn't come close to that because some of their recommendations they didn't realize constraints we had, why we recommended what we did. I think they may have. They may have saved uh, 500,000. But on the report, it looks like they saved 1.9 million. But it's still a check you go through. Um, check. One other thing on the value of engineering the city hired a consultant, the technical consultant, to oversee, review our plans, look at our specs. And he waited until 90%. He was also involved in the value analysis of value engineering. And he waited till 90% design review meeting, gets this smirk on his face, pulls out these regulations, says the DEQ, hey, class A, you got to meet this. So we had, they had two donut plants, donut plants. I don't know what those are, but they're, they're prepackaged treatment units. So we plan on turning those donut plants into aerobic digesters, using the existing structure. Turns out, to meet the Class A disinfection requirements, we had to take one of those donuts and dedicate it just, just to uh, disinfection. Why wait till 90%? Why, is, why didn't it come out value engineering? I don't know. But those are kind of the things that come up. DEQ requires any project over 10 million to do the value engineering. I highly recommend, with this size project, do the value analysis first before you get too far down the road. Make sure we're not missing something. It's always good to have you know have other other engineers and operators look and see. There could be something else that could be done. 
Um, we welcome the, the criticism. Uh, environmental report. With the wetlands, 100,000 might be low. Sutherland, we spent somewhere around 75 to 80,000 to run a 12 inch pipe across the ditch and create a one acre staging area. The one acre staging area is in a hay field, but it was classified as wetlands. It took us, we have a, yeah. we have permits just for those two facilities as thick as this, just permits that we have to adhere to, plus the timing of it. It took nine, ten months to get, get through that. Um, so then we're thinking there's going to be some mitigation. <clears throat> you got review fees, those are DEQ review fees, and then administration and legal. So you're looking at $37 million. So when you add the collection, the pump station, the treatment plant, total project cost of $42 million. And the inflation factor, because really you won't be spending all that money until 2021, it's $46 million. If you recall when I started this presentation, your 2000 facilities plan, when you bring it to 2018 dollars, it's $51 million. So it's just it's not cheap. Yes? So this will take us to 2047, right? 2043. Typically what we found is let's go back to let's go back to here. What we find is because of all the assumptions that these plants normally last longer than 20 years, mm -hmm. a lot of the plants we're redoing, refurbishing, were built in the late 70s and 80s, so they're lasting more like 40 years. With this configuration, it's easy to add additional tanks to increase your capacity. Where the challenge will come from will be for finding uh, recycle disposal sites, and cutting down on your II. Because if you cut down again, you cut down your II, then expansion becomes less of a question. But being able to discharge in May, being able to get the concessions with the amended recycled water use plan, our assumptions that we use to say this is what will work. If during negotiations and dealings with DEQ, that changes, then we need to, we have to come back and that's gonna affect what we recommend. And we're trying to find a balance that, that's not hurting the environment, but that the city can live with. And if we continue on the path of what you're doing now and what you have to do, I don't know if we're going to get there. And I was pretty adamant going into this with, with, with Dan and Gerald. I don't want to look at that option. I think, I think there's, we can provide enough documentation and negotiations where we're asking reasonable things to be done. And hopefully DEQ buys off on. I didn't want to come here with, with the plan you don't have. You don't get any of those. I won't say concessions, but changes. Because what we're showing for a dollar amount, throw it out the window. If we have to, what I did tell the irrigation group, okay, we're recommending class B, uh, recycle water. We're doing something very similar in Sutherland. We're putting four basins in, but there they have to have class A, so we're putting them filters. We could provide piping on this SBR if regulatory conditions change where they say, you've got to go to class A, we can slap on a couple filters, we're done. So, I mean, there's things we can do. We didn't want to add those costs in initially. If, if to me, the other, the other items are, I think are reasonable. Again, we're not degrading the environment. We're just asking for what we feel is fair. So Steve, um kind of recap on what we have underway right now. We have the recycled water use plan update underway. Um, it's in its 35 day public comment period with the DEQ public hearing on July 10th. Um, the land that we go to, um, predominantly Coleman Ranch, um, is graded to be a class D facility. The cemetery is graded to be a class C. So we went with the higher 
of the two, which is class C. The plant that we have proposed is designed to make class B. The intent is, is that we're always making class B. We might get lucky and make class A, but we can't guarantee it. And if we have an upset that drops us into class C, by the time we recover back to class B, as long as we're at a class C at the, um, at the ranch and at uh, the cemetery, we're never gonna be in violation. So the intent is to make the cleanest water possible at all times. But if we do have an upset where we drop into a C, there's no penalty. Right now, we're constantly getting penalized for anything that's below an A, and we just can't meet it. The plant that's out there was never designed to make class A. The other piece of it that we're moving forward with is the permit modification, which um, has mass load increase, um, uh, which we're tying it to the design of the existing plant right now, because the current permit doesn't take into account the body of water that we go to, which is the Malala River, which is a uh, 30 um, TSS and 30 BOD for the Willamette Basin. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's 30 TSS, 25 BOD. 25 BOD. Um, so what we're trying to do under the permit modification is match what plant we have, what we can make, and what the body of water that we're discharging to in the wintertime can handle without an impact to the environment. If we get that change and we get the change to the recycled water use plan, we won't have violation issues. Now, when we move forward with the redesign or the design of the new plant, we're going to have to go through that permit process all over again because they have to set that new permit for the new plant. So right now we're asking for the interim limits based on what we have and where we're going then we'll come back later on when we do this and we'll ask for a new permit based on what that plant can do and where we're going. We're trying to put ourselves on a level playing field with what every other agency in Oregon has to do. <clears throat> the other thing that the group needs to remember is this plant isn't for 9,000 people, it's for 17,000, a lot more people. So you look at, okay, 17,000, what's, what's the comparison? City of Coos Bay, they're about 15. They're just going through, they have two treatment plants. They just finishing up plant two construction. Uh, total project costs 30 million plus. That's the smaller of the two plants. Now they're doing a facilities plan to upgrade plant one. Anticipated total project costs, 40 million. They're spending 70 million. Are they adjacent to each other? No. There's a ridge between that divides the city. Plant two, total project cost 30 million. They went, they went with the construction management general contractor procurement method, where you hire the city hires a general contractor before you start design. They work with the design engineer during design with the expectations that the general contractor knows what's to be on the project. Uh, eliminates change orders, and you can end up with just a good product. Well, I was on representing the city, and I saw the project costs, construction costs, go from 16 million in the facilities plan. First design review went to 80, 18, and then ended up with 24. But it's a guaranteed maximum price for 24 million. So you take that 24 million, we went, low bid in Sutherland, uh, larger plant, tertiary filters, major rehab of pump station offsite, uh, aerobic digesters, biosolids dewatering, 16 million, $8 million difference. So delivery, uh, coming up things that work, that are, I can't say, the least cost. Um, I think we have a pretty good handle on that. So. I don't know, it's a lot of money. There's still a lot of steps to go through. Um, look at schedule. 
Next month, we'll have the master plan done, uh, our same value analysis, February 2019. Secure funding, January 19th, June. Actually, Dan and I are going to a one-stop meeting in Salem on July 20th to see what kind of what kind of monies are out there. For the size of the project you're talking about, it's probably state revolving loan fund, SRF, DEQ money. Um, probably interest rate, I think, is, I'm not going to say. Uh, start wastewater improvements, it's low. I don't want to. Once you throw out a number, man, that's gospel. <laughs> and low is relative. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's good interest rate. Uh, you got to do the pre design report, then do the value engineering, design of the wastewater treatment plant construction. So we're looking at commissioning February 2023. Then you have to go through a one year performance evaluation. And after that one year, we have to send a report to DEQ to say for each process area. Is it meeting design expectations? So we're looking about 2024. And if everything falls into place. Yeah, and I, I wanted to add um, this is assuming that our recycle water use plan update and our permit modifications go through. Um, if they don't go through, I won't be coming to the Planning Commission August 1st. I'm going to have to go through a contract modification with these folks to look at what they actually gave us so that they can redo the tail end of this plan and guaranteed all of those costs that you just saw are going to go up significantly. So um, DEQ was part of the technical advisory committee uh, group. Um, we had a, a environmental engineer from DEQ participate in that. Uh, he understands what we're trying to do, um, what the, the goal is, what the long-term costs of the community are, um, and he's been conveying that to um, DEQ staff that will ultimately be looking at the design of the plant and are also looking at the permit mod. At the start of the presentation, <laughs> I did not mention the mutual agreement and order. MAO, an MAO typically is entered between DEQ and the city to revise on a temporary basis the discharge limits, kind of come to agreement, yes, we can't meet our permit, this allows us to, to violate the permit until we get a new plan. The city is actually meeting with DEQ and the city's environmental attorneys Monday in Portland. The draft is out there. Um, we just finished reviewing the final, final changes, and I think ring vendors can be sending them to DQ by Friday, Friday, so they have a weekend day. But these two guys would be important. Yeah. Hopefully so that, that's, that's a big first step. So, so fingers crossed, we yeah. get the MAO, we get the permit modification, uh, we get the um, recycled water use plan uh, approved, um, that sets us in a really good position going forward of cutting lo loose of all of the violations, not having violations going forward. So instead of dealing with violations, complaints, lawsuits, that kind of stuff, we can focus all of our energy on design, construction, I and I work, and putting our money towards fixing problems versus always spending money on stuff that happened behind us. I should point out, inadvertently, there has been some value analysis already being completed because the city's environmental attorney hired a independent class four operator engineer that did his own analysis of the plant. He's looked at what we've presented and we're pretty much in agreement. So, but yeah. that's, I mean, that's, that's not a true value analysis, but he would be the one to tell Ring Bender, hey, these guys are screwed up if you saw something that was out of place. And they did that uh, separate and parallel to each other. Yeah. So while yeah. they were working on the master plan, this other um, consultant was working on, based on what we have out there, um, what would be the best alternative going forward. And when we got to the other end. But he, he prepared a report on the plant. And then everyone looked at what we did on the plant. They said, you guys talk? No, never talked. And it was almost like that. I guess I couldn't make it in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty good considering. It's, uh, this is a, 
almost a year when we start. August? Yes, July? <clears throat> May. So, May. so yeah, so we've been at it for a year um, uh, working through the existing and proposed. Um, uh, it's, it's a lot to take in in one night. I did receive uh, today, is it today? Yes, sir. Um, yesterday yes, sir. afternoon, uh, the draft plan. Um, I need to read through that, and if everything looks good on that, then we'll go ahead and post that to the website. As soon as I post it to the website, I will send an email out to everybody so that you all can see it, and we'll also um, put a posting um, out on Facebook and the city's website for anybody interested in reading the um, draft plan. Um, it's great nighttime reading. <laughs> so. Yeah, sure it is. <laughs> So I guess the last thing, is there any other questions or comments you may have? If, you know, you're sitting at home and all of a sudden the light bulb comes on, feel free to call us. You know, call us if you have questions. There's a lot of material here. It takes a while to absorb it. I'm sure there's questions. You know, it's, this isn't the gospel, but we'll try to answer them the best we can. I have a question. What does the total present value signify? What, did, what does that mean in actual terms? Oh, okay. I don't know where that. Right here? Yeah. Uh, I should also point out the DEQ and rural development has a technical document that states what has to be in, in, in this plan. So when we develop costs, in this case it's for treatment, we not only look at the capital costs, we have to look at the costs for operation and maintenance over a 20 year period, and then any value at the end of that 20 year period, because what's happened in some cases in the past, we can show, say this being a real low capital cost, but when you look at the gray area, it shoots it way up. So then that's not the least cost alternative becomes the next one. So you have to look at it as a whole, not just construction. You know, we don't want to straddle the city with something that's cost them an arm and a leg every year to operate. So that's why we look at total present ones. And this is actually an excerpt out of um, chapter six. six. So if you look at the entire chapter six, there's a lot more detail in how they get to those numbers. Five. Five. Sorry, Tyler. I got a couple guys from work watching, so I was waiting for a text that announced. <laughs> so, yeah, but then, like in Canyonville, we had the option to do an SBR with filter because they discharge you around to the South Umqua. And it was a tie with MBR. So the city wanted to go with the higher technology. So we're actually doing an M MBR plan. But they're the size of the plant is so much smaller than Malala. It's like two million gallons a day and we have to treat up to nine for Malala. We start getting bigger, you see this is not the least cost alternative. So uh, what is the plan on the end side of uh, payment for this plant to the rate payer? So they'll, they'll they'll end up doing Start the car. Uh, yeah. So how are we going to pay for this? They'll end up putting together um, a, at the end a cost analysis. Uh, part of the plant has uh, capacity increasing, so it'll be paid for with system development charges. Overall, the the plant, the reconstruction of the plant, will be through an SRF loan, be a long term debt. Um, rate payers would pay a portion of that. System development charges would pay the other portion of it. So we use the two funds to make the yearly payments over the over the loan of the period. Uh, yeah, the period of the loan. Technically, fifty percent of this cost is for future the future population. Yeah, but the so, one that you know when you look at funding, partly your size, rural development, it really isn't a player when you get to almost ten thousand people. But they also look at, and when we go to Salem, we're going to ask the state what the, or they'll know what the single family or median household income is in Malala. 
It's over 55,000. It's quite a bit above the, uh, what they call poverty level. So that means interest rates go up because of the higher income. It's based on what you can afford as yeah. a community. Yeah. Um, so there'll be, there's actually two components to it. Um, the, the rate portion of it covers the existing capacity. All the additional capacity would be covered with system development charges. Um, also with the construction of the plant, um, that adds capacity. So the issue of whether or not um, a commercial property can go in along 211, all, all of those um, issues go away because we have the plant that can handle the flows. Um, so as development comes in, they actually will be paying into that system development charges and they'll be making monthly payments on their sewer bill so they'll help pay for the plant long term. Give you an example, um, smaller scale, Charleston Sanitary District uh, pumps in the plant too. They're looking at an eight million dollar, their portion of the plant upgrades are eight million dollars. An RV park, 175 unit RV park is connecting to the district the SDC charge for that is 1.2 million. Ooh, that can go toward the capacity component that they have to pay for up front. But there's the, your, your question was how much is this going to cost an individual homeowner? Yeah. I think is what the question was. Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah, that's we'll, going to be an important question to well, people in the community. It is very, very important. And I think, um, uh, you know, because we, the city has gone through a very laborious uh, rate study process over the last few years. And rates will be a part of this. Um, when we go to, it's called a one-stop meeting where you sit around the table like this. We get an opportunity to present our project to um, agencies that provide funding. And um, part of that's gonna be, we're gonna have to look at our rates. Are they too high? Are they too low? Um, where does that come into play? And so part of it, we don't know the answer. Is is the rate going to have to go up to for sewer? Um, Ten dollars a month for five years? I don't know. We don't we don't know the yeah. answer to that. But it, it, there there probably will be an impact. But we just don't know what it is yet. Yeah. What we'll end up doing is at the end of the when the master plan is adopted, we actually have a plan done. The very next thing that I do is an SDC system development charge update. We don't have to change the methodology. It stays the same. We just change the numbers because the system development charge methodology right now is based on the old master plan. So now that we have a new master plan, we plug those numbers in. It recalculates what the SDCs are for when a single family home connects. Um, after that's done, we do a new rate study. That rate study will end up coming back with what the rate will be in order to pay for. And by then, by the time we have that, we should have a pretty good idea of the sizes of the loan, the term of the loan, the interest rate. They can plug all those numbers in and what ends up coming back out is, is your sewer rates here. Now here's what your sewer rate would be. There's another decision. Okay. I find it very fascinating that you have to go through a shark tank process in order to. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another decision that the council's going to have to make when it looks at financing. Are they going to finance it for 20 years? They can get an SRF loan for 30 years. If rural development money is involved, they're strictly a 40 year. Uh, with each term, that obviously affects the rate. The hiccup in that um, that happened to um, other agency that I work for is they did a long-term 40-year debt. Um, they, they were past the 20-year useful life of the plant. They still had 20 years of debt and they had to make improvements. So they, they ended up refinancing, um, but what ends up happening is, is if you stretch that debt out too long beyond the life of your plant, you could end up having to expand or replace the plant 20 years down the road. So folks in the future would be paying for a new plant 
and paying for the old plant. So it just, it compounds. You want to try to keep your debt, if you can, as close to the life cycle of whatever you're building. It's not always possible, but that's what you want to try to strive for. And I think you really have to consider too that the next upgrade certainly is not going to be as extensive as what we're looking at here. Um, partly is what you have is, you know, just old and dealing with algae and the other parameters you have to deal with it's tough so to go to a mechanical plant in the future you do it now in the future it's going to be a lot less uh, costly to expand for example city of <laughs> celeste we put one of these sbrs in i know Celeste is small but we put one of these sbrs in 20 some years ago they're, they're going on 27 years of operation they don't have to add another basin they just want upgraded electronics, upgraded motors, pumps, but they love the process. So they're not looking at uh, a huge expansion or upgrade or completely tearing it down. It's just mechanical parts, electrical parts. So. And does, by any chance, the contract with DEQ run the life of the plant? No. Or are they going to 10 years down the road and say, you know what? We Technically, decided. your permit is renewed. The NPDES permit is renewed every five years. Yeah. Some communities, they're waiting 10 or 15 years, and their permit hasn't been renewed. So DEQ has made a concerted effort where they've picked seven, I think, seven people from different regions and created this permit division, and that's all they're doing is permits to try to get caught up. But every five years, technically, you get a new permit, and technically there could be... Um, new requirements for treatment. And I think you probably hear, I heard the other day, they're talking about the pharmaceuticals, opioids, uh, clams up at the, the sound. Um, talk about national marine fisheries. Uh, what they want you to do is treat for metals and pharmaceuticals. Problem is no one really has figured out how to treat for pharmaceuticals and no one has come up with what kind of limits you're trying to get to. The metals, yeah, we can do that with stormwater treatment. Uh, but yeah, th that's that's coming down the road. So the cost could go up in ten years again, because we have to add for something new. Add well, that's where, like I, I said, we could add filters. Typically, you're going to add filters okay. to remove more suspended solids mm -hmm. from the waste stream. By doing that, you reduce how much you're putting in the grid. So, so there's there's things that, like say, we can incorporate in, anticipating. I'm saying probably twenty years, you're going to have filters, but just put the piping in now. Mm -hmm. The other thing with these costs, you have to realize with the federal monies, it's the Buy American Iron and Steel. Uh, so we try to put pipes in that are PVC because you got, say, a 20 inch elbow, just the materials, $12,000 before you connect. Huge expense for that, for that requirement, but it goes with the funding. When they look at our demographics um, to determine the interest rate, do they dig closely down because we have a high percentage of our residents who live substantially below the median income? They go based on published numbers from probably Portland State. They don't look at, they just look at what the median household income is. They don't look at age groups or anything like that. It's a number on a board. And it's just that one number, they don't dig down in it. And Clackamas County has recently produced some mapping studies that shows pockets of poverty areas and we don't really actually show they're on the, the peripheral of the city, not within city limits. So that I, I know communities have disputed what, what the state and uh, median household income is and Portland State has come in actually done income surveys mm -hmm. and if they show something lower hopefully then it's you know, to your advantage if, if you remember um fenton uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. fenton avenue was not the first street that we actually proposed and we had a little trouble finding a, a street that met that that okay. income level. right but that criteria was really low yeah. wasn't it it was yeah yeah 
we were we were still able to um, find an area that met that, so we moved it. It was Lola, right? And <clears throat> so when I got here, that that project was already picked. The location was already picked. Well, when uh, Clackamas County folks started looking at it, it wasn't making any sense. Why are we doing it here? Because this area doesn't meet it. So I got together with them. We found a couple of areas that did meet it um, and uh, focused on Fenton because we knew we had some issues there. So we were already going to replace the sewer. That's why we pushed forward with Fenton. So it meets all the requirements and criteria. And just so happens that in the five year um, uh, when they were doing the flow poking, um, Fenton and uh, patrol and um, Lola and Berkeley and then one other came up on the high priority list. So um, we were able to pick one that we knew just from experience had problems in it. It ended up being on the high priority project list. Yeah. So they actually have three levels. You have the low income level, moderate, and then above the moderate. Uh -huh. So with each level, like low, they get the best interest rates, the most grants. Right. Um, moderate. A little less, you get above it, basically not. And we're not, I don't know, we'll know, we'll know uh, July 20th after the one stop. But again, the size of the project, I think uh, DEQ, the SRF program, is probably the only one that has this, this kind of funding available. Um, sometimes they do give, forgive what they call forgiveness <laughs> on the loan. Um, Sometimes they give city money if they do projects that aren't wastewater, but it helps with water quality improvements. So, well, I would say I'm happy to hear about the value analysis step because um, what I hope we can do is not miss any opportunities to do something wonderful for our community, mm -hmm. keep the cost down, and not add burden unnecessarily and and sometimes that takes thinking outside the box looking at alternatives and if that's an opportunity down the road what I didn't what I was concerned about in looking at this plan initially my my unhappy face last time we were here um, was you know getting us locked into going down a path and sure. finding out that we've got ourselves in a place that we can't take into consideration other opportunities or alternative solutions and, and we welcome having some independent look because, like I say, you know, we get we get focused. We didn't come in here with any preconceived idea, but then as we dug into things, it started kind of mm -hmm. this will work, this won't. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think you got to have them come in and look and make sure that you know, make sure you can't do it well. Mm -hmm. The the encouraging part is is that um, going through the plan, we have two separate uh, groups that are looking at it that came up with the same plan. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as getting through a master plan with what we believe to be a good plan going forward, that really put us on solid ground. Mm -hmm. um, but when we go through that next piece where we do look at um, the alternatives and have that other independent group come in, um, if they come back with something different, then I'm sure Dyer and the other group are going to um, want to take a real close look at it. But I think things get missed. The consensus is with the EQ, with the other individual, the independent individual looking at it, uh, everyone associated with what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. It was you need a mechanical plan. Mm -hmm. Well, and and I don't know the background of all these different people to mm -hmm. know what is their level of experience in alternative solutions versus mechanical plants versus whatever. So, you know. Um, we would hope that there would be a variety of, of levels of expertise in these different areas really looking at it as opposed to just an or, a company or an individual that is really just spe specializes in, say, mechanical pan plants, if you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So and that's, that's when you put out the RFP for this group to come in for the value analysis group, mm -hmm. you can say you want a so wetlands expert, you want... You know, you, you can list the expertise that you want to come in and to look at this plan. And we're going to need it if we have even wetlands adjacent to or on the property that we're even yeah, looking yeah. at doing stuff. So. I think it, you have to do your due diligence. you yeah. got to do that. With the, with the amount of money we're talking about and the impacts of the city, Absolutely. You, you've got to validate what we're doing. What would be their 
the effect if um, the population we're growing so quickly now. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not 17,000 is, um, how confident are we in that number? I'm actually really confident in it. Um, so I went back uh, in time and looked at, that's actually when I first got here, um, I started looking at populations every year. I think I went back 20, 25 yeah, years. Um, went back about 20, 25 years, and there's um, peaks and valleys in population. You get these growth spurts, and it kind of flattens out, and you get more growth spurts. Um, overall, over that entire time period, the average growth rate, I think, was I came up with like 2.3%. Um, and I hadn't talked to anybody at PSU. So when PSU was coming out with the um, uh, proposed updates for, for growth, um, one of the representatives of PSU called me and I said, well, you know, what, what number did you come up with? And I think they came up with like 2.4 or 2.5. So we independently came up with pretty close numbers. And so I, then I told him what I came up with. And, and so they felt comfortable that their projection going forward um, over the long term was was going to be good. So and th Just, that's a number we have no control over. That's a number that we're mandated to use. So would you happen to know what the growth rate was over, say, the last 10 years? Not off the top of my head, but I have it in a spreadsheet. I could, if you sent me an email um, asking, okay, what was it over the past 5, 10, understanding that there's uh, peak growth, then I could tell you what the average growth rates were over that time. Well, my, my, my question in my mind on this is that Malala's growth has been spurred by the spread of the metro area. And so it, to me, it seems logical that it is changing, mm -hmm. this, that the growth rate would actually increase. So that's why I wanted to ask those questions. Well, what what the state of Oregon did, because if you look back historically on population projections, um, our cities kind of did their own, and now it's it's, yeah. a, it's a coordinated number between the cities within a county and the county, and we go through one location, and so all those population projections, whether it's in the TSP that we're working on now, it's the same population projection that we're using for this plan. Um, and Malala is, is, is uh, uh, you know, in the housing study that, that the county's working on right now, and, and they, um, yeah. Malala is the affordable housing location for Clackamas County. Um, and affordable is, yeah. depend on your perspective, okay? Um, but it's a place that, that some people are leaving the metro area to, because they just don't want to be there anymore. Some of its affordability, um, and there's a number of reasons why it's strategically located. If somebody was actually picking a place that you could be halfway between Portland and Salem, it would be Malala, and 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 that's unique for 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 Malala. But uh, um, the the interesting thing, if you go back to '85 when the timber industry changed, Malala's population actually went up after that occurred. Is that right? And through the recession, it actually climbed. Um, I don't know how to answer that, but but uh, PSU came up with these numbers and they're coordinated. That's what we have to use. I believe we need more property to build on too, don't we? You might? Yeah. <laughs> exactly before the population goes. Councilor Board? So um, <clears throat> if I understand correctly, part of the advantage to an SBR plant is that in five or 10 years, if DEQ decides to change the rules, we have the option with this type of plant to add some filters to the plant to make it that, client. That, is that that's correct? correct. That the, during design, we can incorporate, make sure the grades are such, and the piping such that you can add filters. We're talking they're disc filters. Um, not like the filters you have now, totally different. Um, but 
Yeah, I'm thinking good chance within 20 years that that's probably going to be a requirement. And um, so I hate to ask this question, but what at the going rate, what are these things? What are the, like, let's say they change the rules in 10 years and we need to add them. At today's numbers, what it, what it, what is that going to cost? A filter. Well, for the for changing the the plant to add these filters. And what's the longevity of the filter? Well, the the, the ones we're putting in Sutherland, it's actually a stainless steel, very fine mesh. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we're not. It's it's so different from what you have now. And so, probably every ten years, you got to replace the mesh. But it has a very low backwash rate and very efficient. Um, wow, what does this cost? I'm thinking in Sutherland, because not only have the filters, then you got to deal with the controls and other electronics on it. Right. Um, and then I assume more than one, or is that not correct? No, we put two in in Sutherland, but we just use them in the summertime. So that's really when all these restrictions are enforced, the TMDL is the summertime. Right. You know, you're probably gonna quote me, but no, no. I, I just I I, I just don't know. No, no. I, okay, yeah. I didn't know whether it was, you know, five hundred thousand or no, I think or ten units, million or I think the units and two and a half to three million is probably high. The the units themselves are so three million five hundred thousand. So three, three million. million. So safe, safe number. So if number. so if things change, we may not have to go out for a bond to upgrade if we use the SBR. That's part of the advantage. Especially I'm thinking your population is going to be at least half as much again. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that that's huge. Most of the communities we deal with, you're not dealing with two full populations. You know, they're not doubling, but because, like Dan was saying, your location, you're going to double. And we're seeing one and a half, two percent growth. Actually, we used to estimate two to three percent, too high, too high, for rural, rural Oregon. So, I know the population projections in the 2007 improvement plans showed the city at a higher population than what you actually are now. Yeah. And that was that was common when um, at that time when they were they were they were really overestimating. Um, I saw a master plan that was like 2004 2005, right before everything tanked out, yeah. and they were like, the "Sky's the limit. This is never going to end. Six we're going to keep building. Yeah. Everything's roses from here on out." And then as soon as they got the master, and so they had they had the, uh, in the master plan designed for this huge plant. And ex expanding pipes, uh, upsizing pipes because of all of this growth that was coming into the community. And two years later, ka chunk. Yeah, that's why DEQ said you have to use Portland State. Everyone yeah. uses Portland State, they're on the same plane. Yeah. Yeah, we, we ran into problems here like that because yeah. the growth rate was just ridiculous. Was, yeah. And yeah. then it just died. Yeah, it was uh, not even half. The actual growth rate isn't even half of what they were projecting. Yeah. So, and and the scary part on that when they were doing those is that you have these high priority projects the first five years, where cities all over the place were trying to get these projects built for all this growth that was coming in, and then the growth didn't happen. Right. So now that now that they've changed the rules to go with the PSU numbers that aren't these outlandish projections, we're we're building projects when we need them, right before we need them. Any other questions or, you good? Well, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. I think Good we questions. can adjourn. I know this is a tough one to swallow. <laughs> Done a good job explaining it. Thank oh, you. Thank you. No. So there's, uh, Next meeting. there's, there's no um, public no comment. Public comment. Um, and uh, next steps, uh, if we're able to make it through the recycled water use plan with approval and permit modification, um, I'll be bringing this forward to the Planning Commission uh, August 1st meeting. Um, if it passes the first night uh, with the Planning Commission, the next available date uh, to take it to City Council would be the August 22nd. It's the uh, fourth 
Wednesday in August. Um, so that's um, that's the short path. If we end up in the Planning Commission going to meetings, then we're um, we're looking at sometime in September for City Council, and then however many meetings it takes to get through that. And will you remind everybody the July tenth? Yes, meeting. July tenth uh, at the Adult Center. Uh, it is a meeting that's being held by DEQ. It's a public hearing, um, and it will start at 6 o'clock. It will end at 8 o'clock. There'll be a, um, an introduction, a short presentation, and a balance of the meeting will be um, open for public comment to DEQ representatives. Um, they're allowing uh, um, five minutes uh, per public comment. Um, and depending on the number of people, if there's a certain number of people and we have a certain amount of time, they may increase that five minutes to six minutes, seven minutes, or something like that. They're going to play it by ear. What time does the meeting start? Six, six o'clock. From six o'clock to eight o'clock. And it will be advertised in the newspaper um, next Wednesday. So we have to do a minimum 30-day advanced um, notification or public notice, um, and that's actually longer than 30 days. So, And we're giving a presentation to explain the changes? Correct. What, what, are the, what are the modifications for the recycled water use plan, from the old plan to the new plan? So pretty short presentation. I think they said like 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Um, and and then after that DQ, what? <laughs> well, it will be less. It's not this plan. It's not this plan. The extended twenty five yeah. minute yeah. plan. Yeah. So we're, yeah, we're only talking about the recycled water use plan. So um, and then after that uh, DQ will um, uh, they're in charge of the meeting, so they'll be taking public comment and um, and. Uh, I think we have a total of two hours, and at 8 o'clock, they'll, they'll end the public meeting. Okay. 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 Thank you. Anything else? All right. Okay. I thank you for all being here. Thank you. Thank you. Another Russ? Another meeting. Sorry. I'm holidays.